Well, thanks for having me. I want to thank Kate, uh, my, own, my old comrade from graduate school, for inviting me here. It's wonderful to be back in Tucson, having spent eight years here. Um, I, I, it brings me back to the times I would sit in uh, seminars in the Department of Anthropology at the university here. And every speaker we had who came in in the wintertime would make some crack about the weather. It got old, but coming from Laramie, Wyoming, uh, <laughs> I'm doing it myself. Um, let's see, 15 years ago, I first came to Tucson, 15 years ago. Um, and I went to one of those seminars. And I was the first person in the room. I was on the second floor of the anthropology building. Uh, I don't remember the room number. I'm sure some of you do, like Brit 216, is it? And the first person in there, like an eager young graduate student, I sat right in the middle of the room. I don't remember who the speaker was. I think it was Jim O'Connell, but I, I don't know. Uh, and this old guy comes in and sits right next to me. The room's empty. But he comes right in, and he sits right next to me. And he says, hi, I'm Paul Martin. <laughs> Strangely enough, about six months prior at the University of Wisconsin, uh, I took a seminar that changed my life. It was on the colonization of the New World. And I was forced to debate the cause of Pleistocene extinctions. And I was forced to take the position of overkill. The idea that humans caused the extinction of some 35 genera of Pleistocene megafauna in North America. And in doing that research, I had pretty much concluded that overkill actually didn't make much sense. So when I found myself sitting next to Paul Martin, <laughs> being a young man, first year of graduate school, thinking, of course, that I knew everything, despite being starstruck, I said to Paul, I said, Paul, um, nice to meet you. I don't believe in overkill. <laughs> and Paul, being Paul, he said, Todd, uh, I'm pretty far out on the limb, but if, if anybody's comfortable being out there, it's me. He invited me up to Tumamak Hill. We're in the shadow of Tumamak now, in the shadow of Paul Martin. Um, and I spent many many days in his office, next to his case, full of sloth dung and mammoth dung, talking about Pleistocene extinctions. Paul never really managed to convince me, but later in my career, I came across facts that convinced me that, in fact, it was Paul that was right, and it was me that was wrong. And uh, I want to talk about that, that conversion today, why I came to believe that, in fact, overkill is the only explanation for the extinction of not only mammoths and mastodons, but camels and North American horses, sloths, and some 30 other genera that went extinct in North America some 13,000 years ago. So what was really the hang-up for me, and, and I should note, I'd like to dedicate this to Paul. If you, most of you probably knew Paul, and if you don't know, Paul passed away uh, this fall. I consider him to have been a dear friend, and, and I miss him, miss him terribly. Um, so with that, uh, let me tell you how I, I came over to Paul's way of thinking. As an archaeologist, um, I am very much reliant on material evidence. Archaeological sites are in and of themselves material things, filled with material things. Archaeologists need material evidence in order to test hypotheses. The overkill hypothesis, what I would consider its greatest weakness, in North America at least, are we getting feedback a little bit? Its greatest weakness is the scarcity of material evidence. There is not a lot of evidence for human hunting of extinct megafauna. Now you folks live, as Jesse, where's Jesse? Jesse will tell you, in one of the great places in the world for finding evidence of human exploitation of extinct megafauna. Down in the San Pedro Valley, we have this wonderful concentration of evidence for human hunting of mammoth. And that pattern, in fact, is repeated across North America. And we have that, that pattern in Wyoming as well. We have our own mammoth kill site up there. 
But beyond mammoth, evidence for human hunting of extinct species is extremely rare. In some 35 genera, genus, that's the plural of the word genus, so more than 35 species of animals went extinct at the end of the Ice Age 13,000 years ago. Yet we have no evidence whatsoever, or maybe I should say very little evidence, that humans hunted sloths, ground sloths, or that humans hunted, say, tapirs, extinct tapirs, or that humans hunted American lion or American cheetah. Very little, if any, evidence that humans hunted paleolama or camel. So as an archaeologist, how can you argue that humans caused the extinction of these animals if there's very little evidence for it? Very little material evidence for it. This is what, that's why I had such a hard time accepting Paul's arguments. So such a hard time accepting that overkill actually had a basis in fact. So what changed my mind? Well, the first thing that changed my mind was my wife and I, my wife Nicole Wagesback, right there, in white. She's also an archaeologist at the University of Wyoming. She's also a graduate of this fine university. We both got our PhDs in 2003. We were asked to give a paper at the Society for American Archaeology meetings in a session about Clovis. We decided to ask a very simple question. A lot of people talk about Clovis mammoth hunting because when we think of Clovis, those big fluted points, what do we think about? We think about mammoth hunting, right? And in early Paleo-Indian archaeology, there's this debate about mammoth hunting. How common was mammoth hunting in Clovis archaeology? We know they did it. We find these mammoths full of projectile points. Some people will tell you, well, on average, a Clovis hunter probably killed one mammoth in their lifetime and spent the rest of their life talking about it. <laughs> Other people will tell you mammoth hunting was actually a pretty big part of their life. Depending upon which side of this argument on which you fall, you prefer to see the world one way or another. Some people want to see Clovis as the first people in the New World. They don't really know where they are. They'll exploit anything out there that's edible. Mammoth hunting was rare. Other people want to say, well, they're the first people on the continent. They've got the pick of the litter. They can live the good life. They're sp specifically targeting these big animals. They're hunting mammoth, in fact, all the time. Well, how do you distinguish between these ideas? Some people will say there's 14 mammoth kill sites in the New World. The numbers around there, 14 plus or minus 5, depending on who you talk to. Some people say there's only 14 sites. That's not very many. Some people will say, oh my god, there's 14 sites. <laughs> it's a huge number. And how do you tell the difference between these two possibilities? How do you figure out whether 14 is a big number of mammoth kills or a small number of mammoth kills? So this is the question that Nicole and I set out to answer. So how do you do that? I mean, if it was 1900, before Paleo-Indians had even been discovered, 14 would be a huge number, right? We've been digging Paleo-Indian sites since about 1928. Is 14 a big number? I don't know. How do we answer that question? So this is what we set out to answer. We did it in a fairly simple way. We said, let's look at every mammoth or every elephant kill site in the archaeological record in the whole world and figure out one, some way to, to compare the abundances of these things. Because there are similar sites elsewhere in the world. You've got sites with mammoth and artifacts in Mexico. You've got sites with gomphotheres, another form of extinct elephant and artifacts in South America. You've got sites with mammoths and artifacts in Northern Asia. You've got sites with extinct elephants and artifacts in Southern Europe. In fact, there's about, if you look at the entire world, there's about 45 sites in the entire world that show this pattern. And what I mean by this pattern is you have one animal, a big animal, say a 10-ton animal, 18,000-pound animal, or maybe sometimes a few animals, like we have at the Laner site, and they're tightly associated with artifacts. Sometimes we have weapons with those animals, spear points in the rib cage, like we have at Nako or Laner. Sometimes we don't have clear weapons, you just have a scatter of flakes. Turns out these sites, the first one in the archaeological record, is almost two million years old, dates back 
to almost the beginning of the archaeological record in Eastern Africa and Old Divide Gorge. And then you have them all through time. You see them in Europe, you see them in Asia, you see them in North America, you see them in South America. You see them everywhere where elephants lived, and elephants lived everywhere except those places they couldn't get to, which are Australia and Oceanic Islands. Well, how do you figure out going back to this number 14? Is that a big number? Well, what we can do is say, okay, how much space and time are we talking about when we're looking at these different parts of the world? If you think about Clovis, if you know anything about Clovis, this early period of New World prehistory, I don't want to argue about whether it's the first or not. We'll leave that to somebody else. But it's a very, very short time period in terms of radiocarbon dates. It's only about 400 to 1,000 years long, yet we have 14 mammoth kills in it over a fairly large area. Is there any area anywhere else in the world that shows any density close to this? And the short answer is no. Clovis is absolutely off the charts in terms of the density of evidence for hunting proboscideans. Absolutely off the charts. It suggests that this was not some unusual thing, at least compared to the rest of the world. In all of prehistory, Clovis stands out as relatively unique. People seem to have been hunting proboscideans a lot more so than they did in any other time and place. Beyond that, we discover this really fascinating pattern. This really fascinating pattern that covered all of human prehistory in four continents. The oldest sites occurred in Africa. The next oldest sites occurred in Southern Europe. The next oldest sites occurred a little farther north. Well, next oldest sites a little farther north. And you can track human colonization of the world just by looking at the spatiotemporal distribution of sites showing subsistence exploitation of elephants. Now, that's not too surprising that you don't see people hunting mammoths in the New World before people get here, right? But what is surprising is that once you see it in a region, you never see it again. You see it, for example, in southern Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula. Spain and, and Portugal, there's four sites dating to about 500 to 800,000 years ago that show a, exploitation. We argue about whether it's hunting or scavenging. Show exploitation of Paleoloxodon, extinct form of elephant, the straight tusk elephant. You never see it again after that. Never. The Middle Paleolithic, Neanderthals. You see exploitation of these animals in northern Germany, in the British Isles, in those areas you never see it again. The Upper Paleolithic, modern humans show up in Europe. You see it in Eastern Europe, Czech Republic, Poland. After the Ice Age ends, climate warms, you see it in Siberia, then you never see it again. Then you see it in North America, and then you never see it again. You know that, right? Why? Mammoths are gone. Then you see it in South America, then you never see it again. Why? Because those animals are gone. Well, if you look at this carefully, it looks like humans show up, they hunt these animals to extinction, you never see hunting again. And this hunting seems to occur right on the frontier, on the edge of human global colonization. This struck me. We weren't looking for a pattern over four continents in two million years, but it came to us. And I thought to myself, Paul Martin, <laughs> what are you doing to me? Darn it, Paul, maybe he's right. So I started looking into this more, OK? And of course, if we get beyond mammoths and we just look at the pattern of Pleistocene extinctions, yes, mammoths going extinct in North America 13,000 years ago. Mammoths aren't the only proboscideans in North America at the time, mastodons, primarily in eastern North America, but not entirely. They go extinct at the same time, right? Horses, camels, sloths, dire wolves. Giant beavers, glyptodons, tapers, all this stuff goes extinct at the same time. Within a couple thousand years of humans showing up on the continent, 35 genera of large mammals go extinct. South America, same thing happens. Now let's go back in time. When humans colonized Arctic Eurasia, after the last glacial maximum, after 20,000 years ago, extinctions happen. What goes extinct? Woolly mammoths go extinct. Woolly rhinos go extinct. Megaloceros, the giant deer, goes extinct. Before that, when modern humans move into temperate Europe, 
the same thing happens. Animals go extinct. Paleoloxodon goes extinct. The Stratos elephant. Hippopotami go extinct. Cave bears, cave lions go extinct in temperate Europe. What about when people arrive in Australia 50 to 40,000 years ago? What happens? You should know what I'm about to say. Animals go extinct. What animals? A huge number of giant marsupials, things called the protodonts, which are called marsupial rhinos, things called zygomaturus, or marsupial hippos, huge kangaroos, huge flightless birds, huge carnivorous lizards go extinct when people show up. Let's go beyond that. When people colonize islands of the Mediterranean 10 to 8,000 years ago, like Cyprus and Crete, animals go extinct. Pygmy, pygmy elephants, pygmy hippos, pygmy red deer. Shall we keep going? When people show up in the Caribbean, the Caribbean wasn't colonized when the rest of the New World was. Four to 5,000 years ago, the Caribbean was first colonized. What lived there? There were ground sloths on a lot of those islands, like Cuba. They survive the transition from the Ice Age to the Holocene. They go extinct when humans show up. Let's keep going. Madagascar, big island off the east coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean. People show up 2,500 years ago. Animals go extinct. Giant lemurs go extinct. Elephant birds, the largest flightless birds to ever walk the planet, go extinct. Tortoises, large tortoises go extinct. And I can keep going, and I'll end it on this, New Zealand. The islands of New Zealand colonized 700 years ago, and like 12 species of moas go extinct. This is a pretty clear pattern in the archaeological record. Paul, your neighbor, your old neighbor, Paul Martin, has been saying this for 30 years. This is not, these are not my arguments. These are Paul's arguments. Based on that alone, I think it's hard to be skeptical of this idea that these extinctions were caused by humans. We can argue about whether hunting was the cause, but I think it's very difficult to make the argument that it was caused by humans. But again, I'm an archaeologist. All of you are archaeologists or are interested in archaeology. Would you be willing to accept the argument that humans caused the extinction of North American ground sloths, even though we have basically zero evidence that anybody ever hunted a sloth? And this is the hang-up. And this is what I want to try to get us beyond. It's taken me a long time. Let's talk about some of the problems. As I just told you this story, I think it's pretty compelling. And often with this story, when you zoom out and look at it from a big perspective, look at the globe or look at it from a continental scale, it's pretty compelling. When you go in and look at the details, you zoom in and look at individual sites and details, it gets a little more problematic. So let's talk about, let's talk about North America. In North America, the extinction event happened around 12,900 BP, or 13,000 years ago. As I said, 35 genera of animals go extinct at that time. But do we really know that 35 genera of animals actually made it up until the time that people were on this continent and then all went extinct suddenly? Do we really know that? Well, how do you date the extinction of an animal? Obviously, you go in the fossil record, you collect a lot of fossils, and you date them, right? And you find the youngest date that you have, and you say, OK, this one is closest to the extinction date. But dating the precise extinction of 35 animals is not something that's easy to do. Imagine the samples that you need. Do you know how many American cheetah fossils that we have from the fossil record? Not a lot. We have a lot of horses, we have a lot of camels, we have a lot of mammoths, but certain things are very, very rare. When you're trying to date the extinction of rare things, it can be very difficult to do, because to, to estimate an extinction date, you need a lot of dates. It's like trying to find, imagine finding the actual last mammoth that walked in the New World. The chance of finding that in the fossil record is basically nothing, right? And if we look at the dates for all these the extinction dates that we have for all these taxa that went extinct in the New World, we can only show that 16 of them, of the 35, we can only show that 16 of them actually 
survived to the point of human colonization of the new world. 16, we can only de demonstrate with absolute certainty that humans would have been able to interact with 16 of these animals. The rest, we can't even demonstrate that they made it until the time of human colonization of the new world. If they weren't even here when people showed up, how could humans have caused their extinctions? They simply could not, right? So this is what I'm talking about. You look at it from a big global perspective, it looks very clear. Humans are implicated. When you zoom in and look at the details, it gets tricky. So, for example, if I can't establish that paleo llama, an extinct form of North American camel, made it to the time of human colonization, does that mean they went extinct before humans showed up and there was some other cause for their extinction? Or does that mean that we simply haven't found an animal young enough? They actually made it up to this time period. We just haven't found an animal yet. And how do you tell the difference between these possibilities? I mean, the archaeological profession to this point is sort of, you know, throwing our hands up in the air and say, well, we'll just wait until we get more data. That's not a very satisfying solution, you know? So one question that I became involved in answering with a graduate student at George Washington University was, how do we distinguish between a simultaneous extinction event where all 35 of these taxa actually make it up to the time of human colonization of the New World and then they get knocked out versus this was actually a staggered extinction event. Some things made it up to the time of human colonization and other things went extinct earlier. If it's a staggered extinction event, we have to invoke at least other causes, right? Humans could have still been involved in the extinction of some things, but we have to invoke some other extinction mechanisms, which brings us to the other classical explanations for Pleistocene extinctions. And you should be somewhat familiar with these, right? I would say the major, um, the major uh, uh, competition to the overkill hypothesis would be that climate change was somehow responsible. This time period, 13,000 years ago in North America, was a time period of pretty incredible climatic change. We're going from a glacial to an interglacial period. We have massive mile-thick continental glaciers covering much of the northern part of the continent. All of Canada is under ice 20,000 years ago. Then the world starts to warm. These, these glaciers are retreating. Sea levels are rising. Plant and animal communities are reorganizing. Major reorganization of ecological communities obviously could wreak havoc on animal populations, and many people have evoked climate and ecological change as a mechanism for extinction. Another argument that's been more recently proposed, disease. The idea that humans bring with them some kind of disease to which New World animals had no resistance. Much like Native Americans who first experienced old world diseases and were decimated by them. The argument goes that humans or perhaps domesticated animals they brought with them, like domesticated dogs, brought some pathogen that's highly lethal and highly contagious that wiped out these animals. And perhaps the most recent contestant in this competition is the idea that extraterrestrial impact did it. A comet or an asteroid exploded over North America or hit the North American Laurentide ice sheet, producing a huge shock wave causing the extinction of these animals. Um, I'm not going to talk any more about the comet idea, although I will say I spent 18 months in my lab trying to replicate data from the original study, results in the original study, and had no success whatsoever. I'm very skeptical of extraterrestrial impact. But I think the other two are reasonable hypotheses, although they remain very difficult to test. So let's go back to this idea of are we dealing with a synchronous extinction event, which overkill is very capable of accommodating. Everything makes it up to the time of human arrivals, a human arrival, and then humans knock them out versus a non-synchronous or staggered extinction event. How do you tell the difference between those things if we don't have fossil specimens that date to this last part of the Ice Age. My colleague at George Washington University, I should give him credit for this work, this is primarily his idea, it's a really simple idea. 
He says you just look at the relationship between how common something is in the fossil record and the youngest date that we have for it. And using these two variables, we can distinguish between these two hypotheses, which is why I have this nice pad of paper here. Kate wouldn't let me use PowerPoint in my crutch, so I have to draw for you. Here's the basic idea, OK? I can't operate without graphs. I'm sorry, I'm a dork. This is, we'll call it sample size. This is how common something is in the archaeological record. And this is the youngest date that we have for it. The extinction date, the last appearance date, whatever you want to call it. And we can plot a bunch of animals on here. So some things are very common in the fossil record, like horses. And what's the youngest date that we have for them? Let's say this date here is the date of human colonization. Let's say that's, I don't know, 14,000 years ago, plus or minus three. It doesn't really matter. In the case of a synchronous extinction event, everything goes extinct within this time period, after people arrive. What would we expect this to look like? Well, things that are re really common, excuse me, really common in the fossil record, that we have a lot of dates for, right? If everything goes extinct after this time period, things that are really common, we'd expect to have young dates for them. We should have a pretty good idea for um, exactly when they went extinct. So we'd expect to find you know, mammoths, horses, camels. They made it up to the time of human colonization. So this situation here, tell me if you can't see this. What about things that are really rare in the fossil record? We only have two dates for them. Well, by chance, we might find one that's young, but often we're going to find, you know, we can't demonstrate they made it to this time period. The youngest date we ha have might be 30,000 or 20,000. Things that are really common, though, we should have young specimens, right? And then if we fill in this, what we'd expect to find in the case of a synchronous extinction event is something like this. For 35 genera of extinct species, we'd expect to see this. Things that are really common in the fossil record, yeah, we know they made it. Things that aren't common in the fossil record, yeah, we have some examples of things that made it to human arrival, but other things we're not sure because we, we haven't found a young specimen yet. And what you expect to see in the case of synchronous extinction is this wedge-shaped distribution. In the case of a staggered extinction event, what do you expect to see? Well, you might have things that are really common in the fossil record. Same axes. I'm not going to label them again. It's a cardinal sin. My students would give me a hard time. But if we might have some things in a, or a staggered extinction event. Let's say we have something that went extinct 30,000 years ago, but it's really common in the fossil record. We're not going to be able to find anything younger than 30,000 years, even for things that are really common in the fossil record. Things that are really rare in the fossil record, again, we'll have old dates. We might have young dates. Some of these things that are really common may have made it up to the time of human humans in the new world, but you'd expect to find, in contrast, this pattern. That the relationship between the youngest date you have and the abundance in the fossil record is basically this. You have, essentially, no relationship whatsoever between the two. The really damning thing is if we would have something that was, is really common in the fossil record that we can't find a young one of, right? That would really indicate you know, this thing didn't make it to the time of human arrival in the New World. Well, are there any animals in the fossil record that meet this condition? They're really common, but we can't establish that they made it up to the time of Clovis. Well, it's not a hard hypothesis to test, because we have these information. They're out there. There's data that can be collected, and we can do this analysis. And it's really simple to do, and we did this. So what we found was this. The data look absolutely like this. Things that are common in the, in the fossil record, we know made it up to the time period of human colonization. Things that are rare in the fossil record, yeah, we can't establish yet that they were there. Doesn't mean that we necessarily will be able to, 
But with a sample size of two radiocarbon dates and an American cheetah, should we really be arguing about whether this is meaningful as to whether we <coughs> have found them you know, in Clovis age deposits yet? What we found was the record is absolutely 100% consistent with a synchronous extinction event. And I should note, we define synchronous as extinction occurring within a 1,200 year time period. So geologically synchronous, not within five minutes, bang, everything's gone, within a 1,200 year time period. It looks like this. Paul Martin. Always gets me, that Paul. Now, this pattern is absolutely consistent with overkill, right? Everything seems to go extinct, or at least it's consistent with everything going extinct after humans show up. But this is also a period of dramatic climate change. I would say this pattern is consistent with a climatic or ecological explanation for extinction. It's definitely consistent with a comet coming in and exploding over the new world and wiping everything out instantaneously. Although I don't want you to take that hypothesis seriously, it's consistent with that idea. And it's definitely consistent with hyperdisease. This notion that we can't demonstrate, though, that 19 taxa made it up to the time period of human existence in the new world, the important point is, does not invalidate, does not falsify overkill. And in fact, the data right now are completely consistent with the overkill hypothesis. Okay? So here's what we know. Everywhere humans show up, animals go extinct. Everywhere. Everywhere humans show up, preferentially large animals go extinct. Where we have the data, those extinction events seem to be synchronous. From other work I've done with Dr. Wagespak, my wife here, doesn't like to be the center of attention, She's rolling her eyes at me. We know that humans preferentially targeted large animals. The animals that go extinct, humans are preferentially targeting them in the late Pleistocene of North America, okay? So what's the problem? Why are we skeptical of overkill? because I can't show that anybody ever hunted a sloth, right? You really want me to show you evidence that people hunted a sloth. I can't. It doesn't exist. I can show you that there are some dermal ossicles from sloth at certain sites, like the Aubrey Clovis site in Texas. A dermal ossicle, ground sloths are the coolest animals. They're like huge, they're heavy, they're big and slow. They have no defense except their bone is armored. They have these little Nuggets of bone in their skin, in their chest. Really cool animals. They're called, those bones are called dermal ossicles. And yeah, they show up in Clovis sites now and again. But does that indicate Clovis hunting of sloths? Probably not. Not with any confidence, anyway. So let's turn this question on its head. Not, you know, show me evidence for sloth hunting, or I'm not going to believe people ever killed a sloth. But let's ask this a slightly different way. And here's where I'm going to get kind of technical and statistical on you. For that, I apologize. But this is how I operate. Let's ask this question. If humans caused the extinction of 35 genera of large animals in North America 13,000 years ago, how much evidence should we have found? How much? Is it really reasonable to expect that we should have found evidence of sloth hunting by now? And how do you answer that question? And this is the approach I want to take. And this is what I would say is the fatal flaw of the overkill hypothesis, why I had such a hard time believing that Paul Martin. What people who criticize the overkill hypothesis will tell you is, Let's look at another case. Let's look, for example, at the islands of New Zealand. Two islands, North and South Island of New Zealand, colonized 700 years ago, 
12 species, uh, it depends who you ask. I don't remember what the actual count, but you have these giant flightless birds, the moa, eggs this big, you know, big beefy birds, bigger than ostriches. They go extinct right after people show up, and nobody argues about what was the cause. Why? Because in New Zealand, there's like 150 archaeological sites showing human exploitation of moas. There's kill sites. There's big middens of moa bones. There's cut up moa bones. There's burned moa bones. There's battered moa bones. There's no question humans hunted moa. Humans hunted them. They preyed upon their nests. There's lots of moa eggs in archaeological sites. People killed moas. What critics of overkill will say is, well, People killed moas, caused their extinction in, North, in New Zealand, and there's lots of evidence for it in the archaeological record. If people did the same thing in North America for other taxa, shouldn't we have tons of evidence for it in the archaeological record here? In New Zealand, tons of evidence. Here, very little. By the way, how much time do I have? As much as I want? I can do that. How much evidence should we have here? We see all this evidence in New Zealand. We should have a lot of evidence here. If the same thing happened in both cases, the archaeological record should look the same way in both places, right? Or is that right? Well, let's, let's compare the two cases. All right, New Zealand. Let's add in a third case, too. New Zealand, North America. Let's add in the case of Australia. Australia is a fascinating case. This is almost 50,000 years ago this one happened. 13,000 years ago, 500 years ago. So let's put that here. Colon or the extinction date for New Zealand, 500. Extinction date for North America, Let's say 13,000 extinction date for Australia. Let's put it around 42,000. That's the best estimate. It's hard to date things when you get back that far. Radiocarbon doesn't work very well. 513,000, 42,000. What goes extinct in each of these cases? A bunch of big flightless birds, the moa. Let's say 35 genera of large mammals case of North America and Australia, it's like 42 species of large marsupials. Let's just say a lot. <laughs> a lot of things go extinct, all right? Now let's talk about the archaeological record of this. How much evidence do we have in New Zealand? A ton of evidence for extinction, for human exploitation of moas. North America, how much do we have? A uh, little. 14 mammoth kills, a little tiny bit of evidence for exploitation of extinct horse and camel and mastodon, okay? A little bit of evidence. In Australia, how much evidence do we have for human exploitation of extinct fauna? Zero. And yet, I want to believe that humans caused this. We have zero evidence, nothing. This is a problem if you're an archaeologist who likes material evidence, right? So how many, is this, is this consistent with overkill? If Paul Martin was here, I guarantee he'd say absolutely. This is exactly what I would expect in the case of overkill. Now I'm going to try to make that same argument in a slightly different way than Paul would. So let's ask this question. If humans cause the extinction of these animals in each of these cases by overkill, how much evidence should we have? Well, what controls the abundance of anything in the archaeological record? Anything. Whether we're talking about, say, ho ho com pots or complete pots or Clovis points or crania of Neanderthals or end scrapers or Neolithic longhouses in Northern Europe. Anything. What controls how common they are? What they're made of, preservation, yeah, what else? What if we've never looked? What if we've never dug a site in Arizona? How many Clovis sites did you expect to have? Zero, right? It's preservation issues. There's 
archaeologist issues, how much we've looked, and there's abundance issues. Let's simplify that. How, how commonly something happened in the past, how commonly that thing survives to the present, how much time we spent looking for it. Things that are rare in the archaeological record, right? They didn't happen very often. Or, and or, they haven't really survived to the present that commonly. Or, we haven't spent a lot of time looking. Things that are really rare in the archaeological record, obviously we don't find very much, right? Is this zero because people never hunted giant kangaroos? It's because they're super rare and hard to find. Is evidence for moa hunting because people hunted moas like crazy? More so than people hunted mammoths? Or is it because people look for moa hunting all the time in New Zealand? It's a difficult question to evaluate these basic quantitative questions of, is this zero meaningfully, behaviorally? Does it really mean people hunted zero things? Does this really mean humans rarely hunted big animals in North America? So let me tell you how I started thinking about this problem, OK? So here's a fairly simple way to think about it. Just think about what percent of the archaeological record we'd expect to show these patterns in each case. Talk about New Zealand. New Zealand was colonized 700 years ago by Polynesian-speaking voyagers. 700 years ago. That's 700. Within 200 years, this is zero. This is today. Within 200 years, all the Moas have gone extinct. Where's 500? About right here, right? <laughs> Roughly 25% of the archaeological record in New Zealand, just in terms of time occurs when humans and moas overlapped. It's about 25%. What about North America? Humans show up. Let's do the same thing for North America. Humans show up around 14,000 years ago, maybe 15. Animals go extinct, 13,000. Then a lot more stuff happens, right? It's a much smaller part of the archaeological record. It's only about 10%. What about Australia? Now, the dating here is kind of funky. Humans show up 50,000 years ago, let's say. 45,000, these animals go extinct. This dating is really poor, I should tell you right off the bat. I don't know these dates with any confidence. We know it's a small part of the record. A lot of stuff happens after that in Australia. It's simply a much larger part of the archaeological record in New Zealand because it happened so much more recently. In fact, if we just go in terms of the amount of time in the archaeological record, the percentage of time where humans coexisted with extinct fauna, we'd expect archaeological evidence to be four times more abundant in New Zealand than in North America and Australia. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going through puberty. <laughs> That's funny, huh? <laughs> Late bloomer. Um, but but it's, it's more complicated than that, right? Because not all periods of the archaeological record are equally represented. When people first show up, we're talking about small populations. And through time, those populations grow. You have a lot more people living in North America at the time of European contact than you did at the time of colonization, which means recent time periods are going to be a lot more abundant in the archaeological record than ancient time periods, right? How many of you have found an archaeological site out walking out in the desert? Almost everybody, right? Yeah. How many of you have found a Clovis site? Anybody? Alan, yes he has. He's the only one. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> and I've looked my whole darn life. Right? So through time, if we just think about human populations, right? Time and pop size, population size. By the way, my figures are being auctioned after this. They're very valuable. <laughs> At the time of colonization, which we'll put right here, right? We're talking about a very small population. And that population grows, and human populations grow curvilinearly, not linearly. The rate of growth increases through time. Eventually, they might level off and look like this, right? More people leave more stuff in the ground. 
The archaeological record of recent time periods is way more abundant than the archaeological record of ancient time periods because a lot more people leaving a lot more junk around, right? It's really that simple. So let's think about New Zealand 700 years ago to 500 years ago. Let's say 700 is here, and this is 500 here. This is when moas go extinct, and this is today here or European contact, New Zealand, which is around here. Quite a bit of the archaeological record, here the area of this curve would represent how much archaeological record we'd have, would correspond to the time period where both humans and moas are around. What about North America? We're talking about a lot more time and a lot more population growth, right? There's human populations at the time of colonization, and here's today, if we change this to be 13,000 years or 14,000 years, right? This time period of Clovis, it's a much smaller part of the record. The record gets swamped by all this later stuff. There's so much more Hohokam stuff around here than there is Clovis, right? And there's so much more archaic stuff. Why? It's just a very tiny part of the archaeological record happened so long ago. There's been so much time for it to be swamped by all this more recent stuff. We expect it to be a very tiny fraction of the archaeological record. Okay? What about Australia? Let's consider this, take this out 50,000 years. Now we're talking about a very, very tiny fraction, that time period where humans and extinct marsupials coexisted. A tiny, tiny fraction of the archaeological record. If we just look at it this way, we would expect to find the most evidence for human exploitation of extinct fauna in New Zealand, the least in Australia, in an intermediate situation in North America, if the same thing happened in every case. And there's more. Let's pile on to this. Consider the fact that the longer something is in existence in the archaeological record, the more chances it has to be destroyed the more chances it has to be removed. This means things that are older have had a lot more chances to be removed from the archaeological record by erosion. If you go out here in the San Pedro Valley and try to find sediments dating to Clovis time periods, good luck. It's very, very hard to find. It's very rare. Try to find sediments that date to 200 years ago. Pretty common. It's not that sediments weren't being deposited here in Clovis times, in all likelihood. Jesse could probably speak to this much better than I could. But it's likely that they've been removed. A lot of this part of the record has been removed after the fact, making this even more rare than what we expected just on the basis of the amount of time we're talking about and population growth. All of these factors in combination should make evidence of human exploitation of extinct fauna become increasingly rare with greater temporal depth. Okay? In fact, I would say the situation that we observe today, where it's really common in New Zealand, it's of intermediate abundance in North America, and we're having a hell of a hard time finding it in Australia, is exactly what we'd expect in the case of overkill happening in all three cases. And that's just a basic theoretical statistical argument, but I can demonstrate it empirically too. Here's a really simple way to test that idea. You just Go to the archaeological record of all these areas, say New Zealand. You look at all the radiocarbon dates from archaeological sites, and you say, what percent of radiocarbon dates in New Zealand occur in the time period of human and MOA coexistence? What percent do you think it is between 700 and 500 years ago? There's a New Zealand archaeological radio radiocarbon database. You can look at it online. In New Zealand, if you do that, here's what you'll find, 43% of archaeological radiocarbon dates occur in the time period of human and MOA coexistence. 43%, almost half the sites date to this time period. That's ridiculous. Who wouldn't like finding a mammoth kill site? But nobody has, right? How does this compare for North America? A bunch of states maintain radiocarbon databases. I got like 5,000 radiocarbon dates from across North America and said, what percent? of archaeological radiocarbon dates occur within the time period of human and mammoth coexistence in the New World. Anybody want to venture a guess? 
No? Where's my number? Zero point three percent are about one out of three hundred sites date to this period. I think that's that's actually a generous estimate. One out of three hundred sites as compared to one out of two. Very, very few. What about Australia? One out of five hundred. Point two percent. These are just really rare parts of the archaeological record in North America and Australia. They're really rare. In New Zealand, it's a piece of cake to find a site with Moa bones because it's almost half the record. I've been looking my entire career for a Clovis site with fauna in it. Anybody have one I can dig? <laughs> no, right? They're really, really rare. In other words, why are you expecting me to show you a site showing Clovis hunting of sloth? It's really, really, really rare. Now, it's one thing to say that that should be rare. It's another thing to say that just because we haven't found it, we necessarily will. Okay? I don't know that it's out there. I can't say. The absence of evidence is necessarily, not necessarily evidence of absence. I don't know one way or the other. Right? Here's the thing. I think the overkill hypothesis, as my old friend Paul Martin constructed it, predicts the archaeological record of overkill should look exactly as it does. It predicts we should have very little evidence for human exploitation of extinct fauna in the New World. Very, very, very little in Australia and a ton in New Zealand. But you know what? Other hypotheses predict the same thing. Let's say climate change knocked out most of the fauna in North America. It would predict little archaeological evidence too, right? What if climate change knocked out all the Australian megafauna? It would predict li little to no archaeological evidence, right? I would say overkill predicts this. I would say climate change predicts this. I would say disease predicts this. I would say comet impacts also predict this. This prediction of scarcity of archaeological evidence, I would argue, is a common prediction to every single one of these hypotheses, meaning it's absolutely irrelevant. And this is where an archaeologist gets freaked out. When I tell you the archaeological record is irrelevant to testing the archaeological hypothesis, well, let me tell you something. I think that's very much the case. Let's forget about I want to see evidence that somebody hunted a sloth for a second and go back to where I started. Everywhere humans have gone in the world, shortly after human arrival, big animals go extinct. Humans preferentially hunted big animals where we have the data. These patterns are repeated around the world. These extinction events seem to have been synchronous. In every case, these animals had survived multiple glacial to interglacial oscillations before humans showed up. Humans show up, these animals go extinct. If we can free ourselves from the material constraints of the archaeological record, I think it's absolutely correct that that guy who sat up there on Tumamak Hill and devoted his life to this idea was absolutely correct. And I wish, I, I wish he was here to hear me say that today. And he could say, in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Okay, we're going to go ahead and open the floor to questions. Um, I'd ask that you raise your hand so we can get your question on the tape. And um, if you're uncomfortable asking a question out loud on the camera, I'd ask you to go ahead and please write your question down on these pads. And we have a little bit of a problem right here. So if I could get you to write down your question. If I ask you, if I put the microphone in the front of that speaker, it's going to blow out our eardrums. So I'll start with uh, questions from the crowd. One in a sec. There's been some recent uh, uh, evidence about a, uh, a subspecies or related species of humans, uh, I guess in central China or something of that nature. Uh, is there anything of comparable pattern uh, when it comes to 
Homo sapiens and other human-related uh, species. Are you asking whether there's any evidence for extinctions caused by pre-modern humans? Is that your question? Yep. Yes. Uh, good question. Um, I think that I, I recall sitting up there on Tumamak Hill talking to Paul once. And Paul told me, uh, you know, the first evidence that humans were beginning to manipulate their environment was the extinction of a large giant tortoise in Africa. And I can't tell you exactly the, the, the time period at which that happened, but it's exactly the kind of species which humans could, or human hominids could have a huge impact on. Because tortoises, um, they, early in their life, they invest all of their, their energy into growing a shell, which then provides them with a defense mechanism, right? But for humans, it's a fairly easy defense mechanism to get past. You just need a rock to clock them on the head or fire. Um, other than large tortoises, no. We do see evidence for human hunting of large animals, but I can't think of any clear signals of extinction prior to, to modern humans, except for the pro proboscideans in, uh, in southern Europe, where uh, once you see Homo erectus show up, they hunt those proboscideans. Proboscideans seem to get pushed further to the north, and you never see it again. I will note that it's interesting to ask, though, when you look, for example, at the extinctions in temperate Europe around 50 to 40,000 years ago, straight tusk elephants go extinct, hippopotami go extinct, and also other things go extinct like Neanderthals, which are megafauna. The definition of megafauna is an animal weighing larger than 44 kilograms or about 100 pounds. There were a lot of, of hominids on the planet when, when modern humans evolved in, in southern Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa that aren't around anymore. Did humans hunt these animals? I don't know, um, but they seem the timing for extinction isn't necessarily wrong. Does that answer your question? I'm just wondering if, if uh, there's a similar pattern of you know our ancestors showing up and others disappearing. Uh, I would say the short answer is no. Um, I, if you simulate extinction of large animals, and especially large numbers of large animals, you have to be a very, very efficient predator. Uh, and with pre-modern humans, you see humans hunting all kinds of big animals, um, particularly Homo erectus starting around 1.8 million years ago and after that. Whether they had the predatory efficiency in order to drive extinctions, I think remains debatable. But no, you don't see the major waves of extinctions really happen until modern humans on the planet. The other species. Which other? The, when I'm talking about humans, when I say modern humans, I mean behaviorally modern humans, which show up in the archaeological record, sub-Saharan Africa, beginning around 100 to 80,000 years ago, and migrate out into Eurasia around 50,000 years ago. Before that, no, you don't see any major extinction events. Um, if you're if you can give me more information about specifically what subspecies of humans you're talking about. For example, with Neanderthals who lived in Western Europe and Western Asia for 300,000 years, there don't seem to be any major extinction events associated with Neanderthals. Okay, I think we had a question up front and I'm gonna turn off my microphone and grab the question and then walk back away from it. I got the question. Thank you. You talked about how the propagation of humans matched the propagation of extinction. How does the propagation of climate change or disease compare? Yeah, good question. Propagation of disease is, is really difficult to study archaeologically. Disease doesn't, uh, the kinds of diseases that, that we're talking about that cause extinction, Ross McPhee is the primary proponent of this idea of hyperdisease. It doesn't leave any, any evidence in the archaeological record, clear direct evidence. Okay. Um, a disease that, that, that kills an animal relatively quickly isn't going to leave a mark on a bone, for example. Um, so disease is a difficult uh, one to look at. I mean, what we know is, is that there's a lot of first contact, what we call first contact extinction events in the archaeological record, meaning when humans show up, animals go extinct. There's some relationship there, I believe, and a lot of people believe. disease. Could be, could be the vector, could be the explanation, but it's a really difficult explanation or hypothesis to test. Climate change is a little more interesting. 
The big problem in, in the new world is that these extinction events correlate with a period of massive climatic change. The, the transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene and a little major wiggle in climate associated with that called the Younger Dryas, um, where the Earth was warming or coming out of a glaciation, then it went back really quickly, about 1,200 years to glacial conditions, and right at the start of that, these animals go extinct. It's a very, very severe climate change. That's, that's true of, of extinctions in North America and South America. But that climate change didn't knock out, for example, the sloths in the Caribbean. They made it on through. That climate change can't explain what happened in Australia 30,000 years earlier. If we look at climate through time, in all of time and space, climate is constantly changing, right? For any extinction event, we can point to, yes, climate was not static. It's always on the move going somewhere. But in order to explain these extinction events, which happen many different times in many different parts of the world, we have to choose different climate change explanations, different ecological explanations. And there's no single explanation other than this sort of umbrella idea that climate somehow did it that could explain all of them. North America, I think we can make the best case that climate played a role, North America and South America. And perhaps uh, Arctic Eurasia as well, because the extinctions there happen at the end of the Ice Age as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK, we have a question right here. Thanks. There was a report a couple of weeks ago about, an, I believe, an 8,000-year-old horse skull or some bones found in the Yukon. I'm wondering, have you heard anything about that? And also, there are occasional reports about post-Pleistocene uh, horse remains found in that same area. And if, if there is any credibility to those reports, do you think that there were pockets of, of post-Ice Age horses that survived? And if so, was that uh, in spite of overkill? Or what's the connection, if, if any? Um, regarding the Yukon example, no, I, I haven't heard of that. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised. There's, there's pretty good evidence mounting, particularly from South America, for post Pleistocene survival of large mammals, although they didn't make it far into the Holocene. Um, no, I don't think it's necessarily problematic for overkill. It may have taken a little longer than we, than we think it did. Would we expect there to be pockets of large mammals surviving in parts of, of the New World beyond the Pleistocene-Holocene transition? Yeah, I'd be shocked if, if there weren't. Um, horses are a really interesting example, though. Um, for example, Dale Guthrie uses horses as a classic example of, of how climate change could have caused extinction. Horses um, are not ruminant digesters. Like cows have like three stomachs, right? They can digest really low quality for, forage. Horses cannot. They have to eat a lot more in order to make a living. So if you change climate a little bit and you change the, the plant foods available to horses, um, they're potentially much more susceptible to extinction. And Guthrie argues that e ecological changes that happened from this Pleistocene-Holocene transition caused horse extinction. They essentially poisoned themselves to death. They couldn't find enough to eat that wasn't um, toxic to them. What's odd, though, where we live in Wyoming, we have plenty of wild horses, and they seem to do just fine on their own in a purely Holocene climate. And this is true in many parts of the West. If there's something about Holocene climate that's not good for horses, I'm not sure what it is. Because when we let them go in this continent on which they evolve and live for millions of years before humans show up, they seem to do just fine. Um, does that answer your question? I would, say, I would say that if we do see, though, survival of animals just past the Pleistocene-Holocene transition, it wouldn't necessarily be problematic for overkill, although in the archaeological record, we haven't been able to establish that that's the case. We haven't seen hunting of, of any of these species beyond, beyond Clovis times, nor stratigraphically have we found evidence of it. Another problem with this is dating of bone is really problematic. Radiocarbon dating of bone can be really a difficult thing to do. You tend to get a lot of contamination, a lot of dating errors when you're dating bone. Question over here. I wonder if you could say, uh, focus in on, on uh, 
data of an art, uh, physical record of humans hunting large predators. I can understand hunting large prey species better than hunting large predators and wonder about the, the cost-benefit uh, calculation that went on in that. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, the basic answer there is that if you look at the archaeological record of North America, there's no evidence of hunting of large predators. If you look at the archaeological record of the world, you never see it. Maybe very rarely you see evidence of human hunting of, of large carnivores. Now, does that mean it didn't happen? I don't know. Large carnivores are inevitably, ecologically, they have to be the, the rarest animals on the landscape, right? Uh, generally, when you look at the abundance of animals in the world, small things are really common. Whether we're talking about mice, rodents, or insects, they're super common. As we get bigger and bigger and bigger, animals become increasingly rare for the obvious reason that they need more to eat. As we go up the trophic levels from, from primary producers up to, to herbivores and carnivores, animals become increasingly rare too. Because as you go up through the food chain, energy is, lo is lost in every transaction. The net effect of all this is the big, scary, big tooth animals are the rarest things in the world. You don't see mountain lions out and about, right? It's not because they're all hunted, it's because they're the rarest things that are out there. You don't see grizzly bears very often. You don't see great white sharks as often as you see small fish. So is the rarity of archaeological evidence for hunting of large carnivores because people didn't do it or because we shouldn't expect to see it very often? That's one thing. The other thing I would say is that Paul would always say that you didn't need humans to hunt large carnivores in order to cause large carnivore extinction. You bring in a predator who's preying upon all of your prey, all of a sudden you've got a problem. And that he would say that humans cause the extinction of these large predators by competition, indirectly, not necessarily by hunting of large predators. Okay. That makes sense on one level, but what about the potential of that predator to adapt like the horse to the Holocene climate? We see predators like coyotes adapt from eating rabbits to eating toy poodles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah adaptation is the key. You want to avoid extinction? Uh, that's one way to do it, right? You have to adapt. Um, Adaptation has to happen relatively quickly in this case. We're talking about a couple thousand years. Big animals tend to have long generation times. Small animals, rabbits, reproduce like rabbits, right? They can adapt very, very quickly because their generation times are very short. Big animals, the generation time is extended. So adaptation is certainly is possible. For example, the, the largest animals in North America that, uh, today are bison. Bison in North America today are Nicole, you can correct me if I'm wrong, 25% smaller than uh, Pleistocene bison. They adapted. They survived this extinction event. For whatever reason, that may have been part of it. Reducing your body size, reducing your energetic requirements, shortening your gestation periods, and your generation time can allow you to perhaps survive. This may in part explain why bison made it through. I would note that humans, it's, really, it's a really interesting problem. Most often, predators can't drive their prey to extinction. Think of the classic case of the lynx and the hare, right? If I, if I simply hunt hares, and I hunt them until they're really rare, now I've got a problem. Now my population's going to crash, right? And the hares are going to bounce back. Now my population's going to bounce back, because a lot of hares are around, until I hunt them until they're rare again, and we end up cycling, right? Predators generally can't hunt their prey to extinction. Humans are an exception because we're the ultimate generalists, right? We can eat anything, and we do. We have this incredibly varied diet. We can hunt our prey to extinction and move on to other things. We can move on to smaller prey. We can move on to plants. We can move on to more productive plants like grains. We can eventually start producing our own food, right, which we do. This really isn't an option for more obligate carnivores. They don't have the same flexibility that we do, so adaptation, I would say, is much more limited for something like a short-faced bear or a saber-toothed cat than it is, is for humans. Okay, next question. 
You talked about uh, proportionality of several different things, proportionality of, of time, proportionality of visibility in the archaeological record. One type of proportionality you didn't really address is the proportionality of the 35 genera in, in North America. So uh, given you know, what we know about the, uh, the paleo environment and the frequency of species, what, what is the proportion of that and what is the proportion that we would expect to see in the archaeological record of sloth or any of these other genera, um, given the their, their right, yeah. given their overall proportionality in the natural environment. Yeah, that's a good. That's a very good question. The the biggest anomaly in that sense is horse and camel are the biggest anomalies. Horse and camel are the most common taxa, in the in the Pleistocene fossil record of North America, uh, followed by mammoth. Um, we have a ton of evidence for hunting of mammoth, as I said, very, very little evidence for hunting of horse and camel. That's, that would be the big anomaly if we had one right now. Uh, if Clovis folks were hunting horse and camel, we should have more evidence than we have. Um, other things, uh, it depends on where you are. I mean, we're talking about 35 genera here, things as varied as, you know, spectacled bears in Florida to uh, tapers, which are very limited to the southwest. Um, so the absence of some things which are very geographically limited in areas that don't preserve bone in the archaeological record isn't really that surprising. But horse and camel, I think, is a major anomaly. But if we look at the archaeological record of Clovis as we have it right now, which I didn't really talk about too much, and you say, OK, if people were hunting horse, where would we expect to find that evidence? Well, when you think of Clovis archaeological sites, we actually have more than 2,000 sites that have fluted points in them. But of those, less than 30 have bone. And of those, most of those are mammoth kills, or mastodon kills, or bison kills. Now, should we be surprised we don't find evidence of horse hunting in a mammoth kill site? No, right? The absence of horses from mammoth kill sites really isn't a very interesting statement. Where would we expect to find evidence for horse hunting? I think we'd expect to find it in Clovis campsites, where people will, mammoths are different than horses in a big way, size, right, literally a big way. You kill a mammoth, you don't cut it up and transport it back to camp, you move the camp to the mammoth. It's just too big of an animal, right? Horses, you kill a horse, you do cut it up and you bring the parts back to camp. I think we'd expect to see evidence of hunting of horse in campsites. How many Clovis campsites do we have with well-preserved bone in North America? Any guesses? One? <laughs> Maybe one? What do you think, Jess? Not many, right? Yeah, the, the evidence that we do have for horse hunting comes from Blackwater Draw, which has a bunch of different Clovis localities. We have a couple of cut marked and impact fractured bones and a site in Alberta called Wally's Beach. Now we have a couple of horses with artifacts associated with them. Maybe a, my, maybe a primary kill site. But the Clovis archaeological record as we currently have it is not particularly well structured for looking at subsistence evidence other than mammoth hunting. We can argue about why that's the case. Um, but I think this could possibly explain why horses are super abundant in the fossil record, but we, we don't have a lot of evidence for, for hunting of horse in the archaeological record. The archaeological record would be wonderful to, to find some Clovis campsites with well-preserved bone um, to see, see what we'd find in them. Is anybody the guess at this point? Okay, I think we had a question over here. Uh, you've had um, human predation in the New World for less than 15,000 years. In Africa, you had probably had predation at least 50,000 years. And you would assume the population density in the New World would be less than the population density in Africa. Why didn't Africa hunt off all its megafauna? Perfect, yeah. No, that, no, it's a, it's an awesome question. Um, let me just say, yeah, Africa, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, anyway, is kind of the poster child for large game, right? When we imagine big animals in the world, it's Sub-Saharan Africa. That's where we go on safari to see them. North America, twenty thousand years ago, would, would have been very much like Africa. Uh, I wish I could have seen it. Um, what Paul would say. And I'm going to use, in part, Paul's answer, maybe go a little bit on my own here. 
What Paul would say is that a big part of this equation is what he called pre naivete, which is if an animal has not experienced human predation, it doesn't fear humans as predators. So if you've been to Yellowstone National Park, you're familiar with this concept, right? You can walk right up to the elk and spear them, or they might spear you. Or the bison, too. Why? Because animals aren't preyed upon. They've lost the fear of humans as predators. This is true on oceanic islands. Darwin described the same thing on the Galapagos, for example. There's no fear of humans. This would have been true in North America and South America when people first arrived. Humans would not have been viewed as predators, and hunting would not have been difficult. Africa's a different story. Uh, we diverged from chimpanzees in sub-Saharan Africa sometime between four and six million years ago and slowly evolved the ability to be large game predators in Africa. These animals co-evolved with us. They had fear, they've had a fear of humans for a long, long time. This could, in part, explain the survival of large mammals in Africa. Another thing is agriculture arrived relatively late to sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it also arrived relatively late to, to North America, but this is to say that hunting and gathering persisted in large areas of, of arid sub-Saharan Africa for a long time, and you actually had relatively low population densities in Africa, and that continues to the, to the present. Finally, I'll say that, that elephants survive unprotected, not in national and game preserves, but unprotected elephants survived in high, relatively high population densities in tropical forests in Africa, even to the modern day. These are areas where humans as hunter-gatherers cannot reach high population densities. And I think if we're going to look at the survival of large animals anywhere in the world, we're talking about moose in North America, bison in North America, elephants, giraffes, large antelopes in Africa. We're talking about places where humans did not live in high population densities until relatively recent times. And that's what it really takes to take out these animals for whatever, whatever geographic reason it happens to be that humans couldn't reach sufficient population densities to do it. Um, coupled that with pre-naivete, pre I think we can explain the survival of African large game. Maybe. It's speculative. I'll tell you this. No matter what you believe caused these extinctions, you have to explain the survival of large animals anyway, whether you're a climate change advocate, a disease advocate, a comet advocate, for example. You still need to explain the survival uh, of large game in Africa. OK, we've got time for one more question. Why do some large animal species go extinct with human contact and others do not? Bears, moose, elk. Um, in the new world, um, aurochs in the old world. Bears, moose, elk. Bison. 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 Well, bi let's talk about bison, OK? Bison are a fascinating example. They're big, big animals. A lot of animals smaller than bison went extinct in the Pleistocene. I don't know why, why bison survived, but I'll tell you this. Bison, historically, when you read accounts of people, you know, prairie schooners cruising across the plains, they'd, they'd come across herds where they'd just talk about being in a cloud of bison for weeks. Just like endless bison, like a herd of a million bison. Then they wouldn't see a bison the next day, then they never saw a bison again. Bison would just absolutely disappear. Bison are incredibly gregarious. They're incredibly patchy, right? They form these massive herds. You're either in them or you're not. You can have a million bison on the plains, and they can be impossible to find if you're not in the right place. Bison were notorious for this, right? Imagine trying to drive an animal to extinction. In order to do that, you need to encounter them regularly, right? You need to encounter them regularly, pick them off to the point where they can no longer maintain a viable population. Bison, if you can encounter them regularly for two weeks, but then you don't see them again for another three months, you're not going to be able to drive them to extinction. Not only that, if you have big groups of them living together, they can find mates, they can reproduce. Point is, you can take a lot of animals and you can hide them in a big space. Big animals hidden in a big space. They become kind of like a needle in a haystack. What caused bison to almost become extinct in the historic period? We had to get a lot more people on the plains, right? And here's the other thing about the plains. Humans can't really live very successfully as farmers on the plains. They could in these narrow strips 
up the Missouri River, for example. But humans are forced into being hunter-gatherers in the plains. And there's not a lot of plant foods in the plains. They're forced not only in being hunter-gatherers, but being predators, meaning that humans had to live at very low population densities in these big, monotonous environments. So you couple these two things, humans are hunter-gatherers, they're, they're carnivores, and bison are really hard to find. They're really patchy. It can be really difficult to drive them to extinction until you can get a lot of people on the plains. And that wasn't possible until we had railroads feeding the large human populations on the plains. As soon as we had that, bison are gone. They're almost extinct. Moose, where do they live? The Rockies, right? They live in high altitude areas. They eat willow. They eat in places that are, they live in places that are not good for people to live. Boreal forests, places where humans have to live at low population densities. Same story, I think, over and over again in every case that we look at with large mammals that survive these events. These animals survive where people can't survive at high population densities. Is that it? I think so. Todd, thank you so much. It was a wonderful Thank time. you for having me.